Hi, you're listening to Stefan Levera Podcast, a show about Bitcoin and Austrian economics. Today for episode 217, my guest is Godfrey Bloom, former politician, libertarian author, and Austrian economist, and he's recently been exploring Bitcoin, so I thought I'd have a chat with him. This show is brought to you by Swan Bitcoin. You already know Swan is the best place to auto stack your Bitcoin in the US with low fees and easy setup. Just connect your bank account, set the amount and frequency of your buys and rest easy as Swan automatically buys your Bitcoin. Get started using my ref link swanbitcoin.com slash Levera. And Swan is also making a splash on the Bitcoin content scene with Swan Signal. Swan Signal pairs up great Bitcoiners for unique and compelling discussions. It's broadcast live on Twitter and YouTube and also available as an audio podcast. Podcast. One of the recent shows was VJ and Raul Powell, so go and check them out there. That's at youtube.com slash swansignal and the audio podcast at swansignalpodcast.com. This show also presented to you by Unchained Capital, Bitcoin native financial services. Unchained are doing great work to make multi-signature accessible to Bitcoiners. And if you're thinking about your Bitcoin security, consider going from zero to multi-sig with Unchained. You can build it yourself, or if you want assistance, there's a Vault Concierge onboarding package, and you can have hardware wallet devices mailed to you and have guided setup calls to build your Vault together. So the prices range, but you can use code LAVERA for a discount. Also, Unchained recently launched business accounts, so if you want to use them for your business treasury while still holding your own keys, definitely look them up. Go to unchained-capital.com to find out more. And lastly, Knox. Knox is a Bitcoin custodian dedicated to ensuring their insurance protection covers the full value of their customers' assets. So, for example, suppose a fiduciary wants to hold $250 million of Bitcoin with Knox. Knox will seek to obtain $250 million of insurance dedicated exclusively to that account and adjustable to volatility. No fractional coverage or narrow scope. Insurance for what it's worth, a tool to transfer risk. If you are a Bitcoin company, investment fund, trust, or family office, check out Knox for your or insured custody, noxcustody.com. Here's my interview with Godfrey. Godfrey, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for inviting me, Stefan. Thank you very much indeed. So Godfrey, I've been following some of your work for a while, and obviously you are a noted uh, longtime skeptic and critic of central banking and of the modern day banking system. And uh, I'd love to uh, you know get into some of that and uh, understand a little bit around where uh, and uh, I guess I should preface this I'm obviously also a fan of Austrian economics so I'm uh, uh, in a very similar position to yourself Um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you came to become a skeptic of central banking well it's 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 interesting really I've uh, I started my career in the city in 1967 um, quite a long time ago Uh, as uh, part of the uh, pension uh, fund management industry uh, in the city of London, uh, which is I've been involved in in some way all my life. So you can imagine I've had a very traditional background in investment management um, uh, because uh, uh, pensions are all based on yield. uh, They're based on wealth preservation. They've been based on safety, so on and so forth. So that's my background. And that's in some form uh, for over 40 years. Uh, I was 21 when uh, uh, Nixon uh, took uh, the dollar off the gold standard. Uh, And of course, at 21 years old, I wasn't quite sure where that was going to take us. And I don't think I worried too much about it. I was playing rugby and drinking beer, so I didn't fret too much about it. Um, It was some years later, probably 10 years later, uh, when I came. This This was a very significant moment. Uh, in investment management, because obviously, as we all know, uh, it led to the degradation of the dollar, which, of course, is the reserve currency. And I think the uh, purchasing power today of the 1971 dollar is in, in an around sort of six or seven percent. So we've seen a massive degradation of currency uh, uh, in, and obviously all currencies. Uh, even the Swiss franc has degraded very significantly, but not as much as the dollar, but uh, every other single global currency has degraded even more. So in my investment lifetime, uh, I have seen the degradation of fiat currency. Uh, and I've also seen the unhealthy link between politicians, retail banks and central banks, which all the Western boxes are the same, democracies, excuse me, laughing. Um, but uh, they've all based... Uh, their whole policies uh, on the degradation of money and the degradation of money uh, is, is, is what they do uh, and is ordered to do short-term uh, government spending uh, over budget permanently. 
And of course, as a, a fellow Austrian school economic uh, economist, you'll, you'll know, and, and anybody else watching this who is also uh, of the Austrian persuasion, uh, knows that although we have been told, Keynesians have been telling us that uh, government economies don't work the same as a family or a small business, that you can, in fact, in, in, ad infinitum, spend more money than you actually bring in. Uh, we know that not to be the case. And the only way you can go on spending more money than you bring in constantly, year after year after year, year over budget is by degrading degrading money uh, and that penny took a little bit of time to drop with me I have to say to be honest I think it was not really until the early 1990s I realized uh, that we were heading for a, a massive catastrophe uh, and of course that is just around the corner. So this is something that I think many Austrian uh, economists have faced as well is that they've been saying look this is unsustainable this is unsustainable and yet it's taken some time for this to play out right and so that's i guess that's a little bit of a difficult thing to explain so how, how do you normally explain that when somebody uh, expresses that sort of criticism to you it, it is it is difficult because people say you know you've been uh, you've been a doomsday scenario uh, <laughs> merchant now for many years uh, and of course it hasn't arrived yet as far as the public perception is. They don't think, uh, uh, the ordinary person, it, it doesn't think like Austrian school economists think. They know, they know that, for example, when the government says inflation is only running at 1.9% or 2%, they vaguely know that that isn't true. Uh, so when I left school, you could buy... Uh, you know, you could buy a pint of beer for 11 old pence and bar it's £4.50. Uh, they, they know this, but they don't really associate it with, a, uh, you know, that potential degradation. So what has already happened, that it's, it's been so slow, it's like the boiled frog, you know, the slowly boiled frog, which doesn't know that it's being boiled to death because mm -hmm. it's happening so slowly, it just goes to sleep. And that's what happened with, has happened with the Western democracies. They've gone to sleep. Uh, but the reckoning is due to come. And, of course, we do hear, oh, there hasn't been inflation. Uh, they say, oh, well, Mr. Bloom, you said that we'd see inflation with the constant uh, quantitative easing and printing of money. Uh, well, of course, we have. What we haven't seen yet uh, is inflation on the high street. Uh, we've seen inflation, basically, on Wall Street. So we've seen inflation of asset prices. It is impossible for anybody to now to buy a house in London, for example, a young man, a young professional man to buy a house in London. It's just too expensive. I bought my house in London at 21 years old. I put my 500 pound deposit down and I, get a more, I got a mortgage and I bought my first house. Even professional people in their early 30s can't do that now. It's out of sight. Prices are out of sight. I've got young friends who are surgeons uh, in their mid 30s who've just about managed to buy some pretty ordinary properties in bits of London that I wouldn't, you know, be said in. Uh, but they, uh, but this is what's happening. But people, people don't really understand that because, and of course the government cheats. It's only white good. If, if you've got white goods or computer gizmos that haven't gone up very much in, in, uh, in, in cost, uh, they don't notice those things. And that's what the government uses in their basket of, uh, of, of CPI and so on and so forth. Uh, but everybody knows, I'm beginning to realize, that if you have a man round to actually fix the cooker, uh, or if you've got a man round to actually um, unplug the drains, he's now charging twice as much as he did a couple of years ago. So people are beginning to realize this, but it, it has been a slow process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so obviously my show is very much focused on Bitcoin. And I know you've been speaking about Bitcoin a little bit and you've been starting your own journey of learning a little bit more about Bitcoin. What was it for you that sparked that desire to go and learn a little bit more well uh my uh, i used to run money uh, uh big money in the city uh, and of course it's impossible now to manage money stefan you can't manage money sensibly it isn't it isn't possible because you never know what act of lunacy the government's going to come, come up with next and you can't manage money um you know, we've, we've got zero interest rates on bonds or as close to zero and sometimes negative well of course managing I was a fixed interest manager uh, in the city. I won international prizes for, for money managing fixed interest. But fixed interest now, you can't, you can't do it because uh, the government keep interfering, central banks keep interfering, they're printing money all the time. So you can't manage money. 
Now, this penny dropped for me uh, round about the mid-1990s, where I was very heavily overweight for the 1990s in my personal portfolios and mainly financial service equities. And that because you were heavily into financial service equities in the 1990s, you did jolly well. Uh, and I did, I did pretty well on that. But it, then I began to realize that this equity bubble couldn't continue uh, because uh, stocks were coming overpriced. And then, of course, you get to, you either managing money for wealth preservation, which I was up until 2004 when I went into politics. So my role, as it were, professionally has been wealth preservation, not to make money, you see. I didn't, uh, you get to a stage where you, with your clients and your own portfolio, you don't want to make any more money. You've made your money or you've made enough money. <laughs> I'm not a rich man. But I, my, my tastes are humble. I like to go to the rugby club for a few beers and stuff, you know, so uh, my, I'm not particularly ambitious. Uh, I just need enough money for my wife and I to jog along. So wealth preservation is very important. Uh, so I started adding gold. I'm a gold bug, uh, an unashamed gold bug, and I was adding gold to my portfolios. Gold in specie, of course, as an Austrian school economist, you'll know that if you don't have gold in your pocket, you don't have gold. Uh, so uh, I've been building that portfolio for a long time. And incidentally, anybody watching this, I don't keep it at home. Don't come round and knock me over the head and try and steal it. It isn't here. Uh, it's in a lockup. Uh, it's in safety deposit boxes, uh, you know, uh, elsewhere. Uh, so, but I have it and I have the key. Uh, and, and, and that's an important thing. And I was buying gold when uh, our Chancellor of the Exchequer, Gordon Brown, was selling gold. And he was selling gold at something like $250 an ounce. Now, why was he doing that? Well, there's two possible scenarios there. Is he a moron? Well, yes, uh, that's true. Uh, or was he trying to actually bail out the bullion banks who didn't have any? Otherwise, why didn't he go to walk? To, you know, why did he telegraph who's going to sell it next week? You know, he did everything that was wrong. And of course, I came into politics in 2004 for completely different reasons. You know, that was Brexit. That's why I, I came into politics. I've never been involved in politics in my life before. It was Brexit, but I came into politics, and of course, I was under the impression, as a lot of people are in this country, that politicians know something we don't know, and that if we understood what they had and what they knew, I mean, what they knew, we would understand the decisions that they make. But of course, that isn't true. I became a politician, as I met a lot of senior politicians, I had lunch with a lot of senior politicians and ministers and civil servants, and they're all, in fact, retarded. <laughs> they don't know anything at all about anything. Uh, so consequently, they, they don't know anything. They don't have any clever ideas. They're actually stupid. And the most stupid people you will ever meet are politicians and senior civil servants who went to Oxford University. They're all incredibly stupid. Your common sense, your values, your understanding of life, you'll find in an English pub in the artisan classes, the butcher, the baker, the sparky, the hairdresser. They're the people who actually understand how things work in real life. Politicians don't. So that was an eye opener. I started buying gold uh, when the Chancellor was getting rid of it. So uh, I've been buying gold as a gold bug for, well, you know, for whatever that is, that's 20 years. Uh, and uh, that's done me very well. Uh, and I started to diversify last year into silver. I made one very bad call on silver. And then I made a very good call on silver. So I'm even money on silver at the moment in my portfolio. But of course, it's extremely volatile. It doesn't have the history silver of money. You see, again, uh, 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 teaching gratitude to Stark Eggs here as you're a fellow Austrian school economist. But of course, gold isn't an investment. Gold is money, JP Morgan said in, in, in the 1920s. Only gold is money. It isn't an investment, it's money. Uh, so consequently, that is how one has to view it. So I have, but you get to a stage, if you've got your portfolio, your defensive wealth protecting portfolio of 85% gold in specie, you really can't, it goes against the grain to not diversify. You have to diversify. And I diversified into silver and I'm a strategic investor, which you, your, your listeners might find amusing around my old age being strategic. But my wife is much younger, so I have to, I have to be strategic. Um, so I look to the long term, even if it's not my long term, it's my wife's long term. And I have to leave her enough money. 
And believe me, she's capable of spending it. Made no mistake about that. So I'm going to have to leave her quite a lot of money. She's she's a horsey girl. She's got we've got horses, uh, and of course she likes to drink. So what doesn't go in the horses, she'll probably drink. But leaving that aside, um, I have to be a strategic investor. So uh, uh, so gold and silver long term. Now that brings me to Bitcoin, and of course I've been pressured by fellow uh, Austrians, you know, to look into Bitcoin. Time. And I have. I'm not suddenly a Damascene conversion to Bitcoin. And it's only, oh my goodness me, I've so spotted this. I've known about Bitcoin for some time, uh, but I've always taken the view, like Warren Buffett, as an interesting case on gold, but that's another story. Um, I've really taken the view that if, if, if I don't understand something, I won't invest in it. So I've always been very wary about something I don't understand. And Bitcoin uh, is only the logistics of Bitcoin are complicated. Somebody of my age, we already have digital currency. We, we've got digital currency now, uh, but of course it's run by governments and central banks. The advantage of Bitcoin, as I see it, as a, as a, as a new boy on the block, uh, the advantage of Bitcoin is that it's a digital currency, uh, which is something of the future and has to be. You know, we have to settle our bills. I can't go into town and uh, and, and buy uh, and buy a pint of milk, a few pints of milk and a tin of beans with a gold sovereign. A gold sovereign over here is already worth £400 nearly. Uh, so we have to actually get through our day by buying and selling uh, at, at the store and, and, and putting petrol in the car. So we're going to have to have some form of digital currency or certainly a currency in specie, which is small enough to transact. And of course, my old friend Alistair MacLeod thinks that could be silver again. We could go back to uh, silver money, but that, that's another interesting story in its own right. So we have to have some form of digital currency. And of course, we are being told, or the, the rumour on the block is that there's going to be this reset, uh, which makes me, this, this word reset, when governments use words like reset, it means they're going to steal all your money. <laughs> you know, they're going to do something nasty to you. Because of course. Yeah, what they're doing is resetting their own mistakes. I'm very happy with my life, please. I don't want to be reset. <laughs> don't reset me. I'm fine. Uh, you know, or I think they probably know, uh, that there is going to be a collapse of fiat currency and there's going to be a collapse of, of banking as we know it today, which is why they're talking about reset and which is why they want to get into a whole new global digital currency if they possibly can, but controlled by them. Now, the attraction for me for Bitcoin is that it's not controlled by government. There is no point in getting into a digital currency, which is run by, uh, which is already run by the banks, the central banks and politicians. It'll go the same way. It will be degraded. Of course it will. How could it not be? That's what they do. That's but they, they want to. They, they say it's their policy. Inflation at 2%. They want to inflate the economy, uh, inflate uh, at uh, money at two percent or prices at two percent. Well, a man of my age, if you go back, uh, if you go back when I was doing my exams, my professional exams uh, uh, on the economic side, so on and so forth, uh, inflation was the bogey. The one thing governments didn't want was inflation. Now we've got governments wanting inflation, and of course they think inflation is a good thing. Central banks, because they can inflate away their mistakes. But if you're a saver or a pensioner. Uh, uh, inflation is bad for you. Inflation is only good for debtors uh, to inflate away their debt. And so we have now Western society is run for the benefit of debtors, not creditors and investors and savers. You couldn't think of a more disastrous scenario than this. This is crazy. This is madness. So the only way the ordinary individual can get away with this is by holding gold in specie, uh, silver in specie if he can, uh, and, and when I say gold in specie, of course, we have gold coins, which carry no VAT in this country and no capital gains tax because it's coin of the realm. So mine is in coinage, uh, uh, which is important. Uh, and you then uh, then Bitcoin becomes almost if you're going to diversify, it's the only game in town, Stefan. It's the only game in town. Now, I don't accept this gold versus Bitcoin. That's that's a false argument that oh you can either have gold or you can have Bitcoin. And I know uh, one thing I've learned as I've been getting into this now, uh, and it's been fun, fascinating. And what strikes me as interesting is that Bitcoin people seem to be very nice people. Uh, they seem to be nice people. It's quite an interesting phenomenon. Um, uh, very friendly, uh, very helpful. Uh, and that's been that's been interesting. 
Um, but they, of course, are, and I understand this, they are evangelical about Bitcoin. <laughs> and so they are, like the early evangelical Christians, uh, they, their heart's in the right place and they believe in the right things. But um, one has to be... Uh, one has to be careful about how much one diversifies, in my view, a portfolio to something which is volatile. Uh, and silver is volatile. Uh, gold, if you take gold over the long period, gold isn't that volatile. Uh, traders, gold traders, metal traders see it as a volatile thing. But uh, if you go back and as a strategic investor, you have to go back decades. You know, you can't you can't sort of go back. Oh, last month or the month before that. You have to take a strategic view. And of course, to be money, uh, it needs to be relatively stable. And at the moment, of course, Bitcoin is volatile. Is volatile. That's not a problem with me. That's not a problem with me as long as you understand it. As long as you understand it, it can be volatile, uh, and you can lose money in the short term. Uh, and, and if you're okay with that, if your portfolio is structured for that, uh, that's not a problem. So I feel that Bitcoin has a place uh, in every portfolio. And funnily enough, my conversation with, uh, with, with Claudio Grass, who of course you might know, who's a very keen Swiss uh, uh, Austrian economist, quite uh, well known in America and Europe, um, I was saying maybe I, for short term, for tactical diversification, maybe I should look at the Swiss franc again. Uh, which is a fiat currency, but I'm talking when I'm talking about that kind of tactics, I'm talking 18 months or something like that. And it was it was he that actually, uh, as a huge gold bug, a well-known European gold bug, said if you're going to diversify, I think it's more dangerous now. And these are his words, not mine. It might be more dangerous not to be in Bitcoin than to be in it, uh, which is an interesting concept. And that just swayed me to get my toe in the water. Uh, so uh, here I am. But I wouldn't say I was a Damascene conversion because I was never against Bitcoin. I've always been sympathetic. So uh, anyway, he here I am dabbling, dabbling uh, and rather enjoying the experience, I have to say. Well, that's great to hear. And I think for many of us in the Bitcoin world, I think uh, absolutely I can see that uh, that tension there between the kind of Bitcoin versus gold aspects. And I think it's probably fair to say that both have a lot of upside over the coming years. Uh, I think the Bitcoin story, I think, to understand it correctly, I think we have to sort of think about ha what happened with gold in terms of its storage and it, the way that it tends to be stored in more centralized vaults and custodians. And so one of the messages in Bitcoin, as, as I'm sure you might have heard, is this kind of idea of not your keys, not your coins, meaning you, you can self-custody this uh, digital, it's like a digital bearer bond kind of uh, bearer asset, uh, if you will. Um, so I'm, I'm happy, Godfrey, if you have any questions about Bitcoin, I'm happy for you to ask me also. Um, but uh, I think probably the key point I would say is I think we, we, people in the Bitcoin world are viewing this more like this is the world adopting a superior money in some ways that it's got certain characteristics that right now yes it's volatile but in the longer term we sort of can more easily anticipate based on knowing what the cap the 21 million cap is uh and i think that's probably one of the key differentiators there and then just the other key one is just being able to send it internationally without trusting somebody so i think these are probably the key points of um uh, like comparative uh, comparison between gold and Bitcoin. Uh, so I think, uh, yeah, I'm curious what your view is uh, on, on some of those ideas. Uh, certainly, I accept that. And that's why I'm interested in it. And of course, as we all know, that money, uh, money is only money if it's accepted uh, as money and, and, and on trust. And of course, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big step now to, to, to come. Mm -hmm. There's a big step. Uh, forward when people uh, when it becomes accepted you know when you can go into your local store and pay in bitcoin uh, uh you know when that becomes then it's trust and it's accepted money uh, and i think then certainly uh now is the time now is the time you know because if you believe there's going to be a collapse of central banking banking and fiat currency uh, you'd be mad not to have some exposure to Bitcoin. It, it wouldn't make any sense because if you believe that, you would have to have that. The one thing you wouldn't have uh, is money in a traditional bank or fiat currency. You wouldn't have that. So you then got to say, where do I go next? And you're quite right. Gold is 
Gold is a strategic investment and it, it's cumbersome. Uh, you, you know, you can store it and that's fine. Uh, and uh, you, you can cash it in bit by bit to get you through, or you can leave it if, from an inheritance perspective, all sorts of things you can do, which is why I'm a gold bug. Uh, but certainly on a day-to-day -day basis, one has to look elsewhere. Um, because then if you want to sell gold, if you want to sell gold in order to say, get through the next year uh, as, as an individual, um, what do you do? You sell the gold, but you sell it for fiat currency. Uh, and then know, you're back to so you're back where you started. <laughs> you're back where you started. Yeah. Uh, so I understand these things. Um, uh, one of the problems is uh, is 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 understanding Bitcoin uh, from a, a sort of a logistical perspective. And I have a, a colleague, um, my, my colleague uh, uh, Patrick Orton is is a young, very switched on guy who's already investing in bit Bitcoin. He's he's already there. I would, although I've had lots of help from Bitcoiners uh, across the globe on email and stuff, and, and I thank them here for it. Thank you for that. Um, I think if he hadn't been at my elbow to actually guide me through the logistics of it, and somebody who I trust, who's a colleague of mine, who I could discuss it with one to one at this stage of my development, which is very new to this uh, uh, not new to the idea, but new to the actual logistics of doing it. As many people, of course, are, Stefan, when they ask me about gold, you'd be quite amazed the number of people that say, where do I get my gold? How do I buy it? How do I store it? What do I do with it? They don't know. And of course, because I've been in the game for a long time, it's, it strikes me as extremely easy. You know. Yeah. But if you're not new, you don't understand it. It's not easy when you know the answer. It's easy yeah. when you know the answer. No, when you're a quiz master <laughs> and you've got the answers. Oh, you can look really Jeremy Paxman, you know, on University Challenge. What a clever man he is. He's got the answers in front of him. <laughs> Very easy to look clever. Of course. Uh, so bit, digital independent. Let's get slightly away from the concept of bill or, or Bitcoin, not the concept, but Bitcoin. Let's call it an internationally independent digital currency. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's really what we're talking about. It seems to me that that must be the future because I can't see how it could be anything else. But that that does beg the question and the questions that, you know, how do we deal? How do we deal with government? And as a fellow Austrian school economist, you'll know, who is most likely to steal your money? You're not going to get mugged or burgled. You might, but that, that's relatively unlikely if you're in a civilised community, uh, even Australia. <laughs> <You're not> gonna... <laughs> excuse that just a little bit of a dig um but the most likely people to steal your money are the government and they've already uh, have, uh the uh, the revenue in england as you will know have already told coinbase um that they've got to tell them who's buying bitcoin now incidentally that isn't just bitcoin because if you buy over ten thousand pounds worth of gold coins from Baird or Sharps Pixley or the Mint uh, or wherever you buy it from, as I have done over the years, if it's over 10,000, they register that as well. They have to hold that log. So if we see a situation where the, the America saw under Roosevelt, uh, where the, the or indeed back into 1720, when the Parisian police were digging up people's gardens after the Mississippi bubble collapsed, um, they were digging up people's gardens. So I know that the government one day will come for my gold and they will they will suggest a minute. We know you bought this five years ago or six years ago. Uh, and it's, it can be under lock and key in a safe deposit, box, which has nothing to do with banks. I would dream of having that in a bank, a retail bank deposit box. Uh, but I know they can't get at it. They can't get at it. But what they can do is say, we're just going to lock you up until you hand over the key and tell us where the safe deposit box is. Uh, and of course, if they know that you bought Bitcoin, they, they can't get at your Bitcoin, but what they can do is look at the, the, the problem we've had with your fellow countryman, Julia Assange. And you, he's locked up. Yeah. Ever. I mean, it's disgraceful. Appalling. Appalling this can happen in a, in a so-called free society under the principles of English law and our constitution that this can happen, but it can. Uh, we are under house arrest over here. Uh, or we have been. And the, we could only have six people to our dinner parties. I'm 71 years old in, in November. I've never seen anything like this. My father was a fighter pilot in the war. There was nothing like this in the war. We didn't close the pubs in the war when you could be bombed or there were V1s and there were V2s. We invaded uh, on the 6th of June, D-Day. We didn't, the, the army didn't say, oh, this looks a bit dangerous. 
Well, I don't think we'll go today. It looks a bit dangerous. I think we'll stay at home. I mean, the whole thing's mad. We, we have seen the biggest power grab uh, in the United Kingdom in, in the history, probably, I would say, since the Commonwealth uh, under Oliver Cromwell, I would argue. We haven't seen anything like this for 400 years. We're talking about stopping Christmas. Uh, so if anybody thinks that then the government is going to come for you and your money, that they're, they're living in cuckoo land, the government will come. The government will come and steal your money, and they're going to do it sooner rather than later. So the more you diversify uh, uh, and, uh, and, and the more difficult you make it for them to come for it, the better it is. And Bitcoin obviously has a role to play. How big that role is with me, I don't know. Okay, certainly, uh, I think you make some good points. I, you know, I agree. I've been frustrated with uh, certainly the authoritarian turn that the governments around the world have taken in terms of lockdowns and in terms of taxation and the levels of the climbing taxation rates that we are seeing. Uh, I think with Bitcoin, there are a few different answers here. So I think some within the Bitcoin world actually go more private and they actually acquire their Bitcoins in a more private way all to begin with, right? And they, they do it, they treat it more like almost like a peer to peer, you know, almost like doing a drug deal sort of thing. Like they're buying a small amount and they're keeping it. In, and that's, that's one angle that some Bitcoin people do. Uh, the other angle I would suggest is that uh, it's like a, it's almost like an Uber story, right? So if you know, Uber came in and initially in some of the cities that Uber was operating in, they were not technically legal, but they managed to get enough people on side, whether that was passengers or drivers who wanted Uber to exist, such that they were able to get enough of the population that it just became infeasible to totally just ban Uber. And so I think there may be a similar story playing out with Bitcoin in that if there are enough people who demand to be able to store their own value uh, free from inflation, free from uh, that those kinds of government interference, then it may be somewhat of a similar story there. And I think another angle also, now this may not be palatable for everyone, but people who are willing to move overseas for better treatment. So we may see this kind of jurisdictional competition element around uh, certain, maybe a smaller nation might say, hey, we will give you lower tax rates uh, you know, to try and spur that. Uh, I think so. I think there's a few different answers there. And I think also, it just comes down to, I think, longer term, we will actually see governments also try to get Bitcoin for themselves. And so I think that may also kind of change the game too, in that it's sort of like there's this tendency towards so uh, a good book in this space is the Bitcoin standard by my friend Safety Amus. So I'm not sure if you've uh, had the opportunity to read that one yet, but if you haven't, I highly recommend it. Um, and one of the key concepts he spells out in that book is this idea of stock to flow ratio, which I'm sure you're also familiar with in the gold world. Um, and so one of the ideas that he's getting at there is that this is one of the important characteristics of a good money. And we could almost argue it's, it's, it makes it an even better money because it's just got it's 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 a perfectly inelastic supply. Like it doesn't matter how many more people demand more bitcoins to be created, there'll never be more than twenty one million. And so, from that perspective, it may also be that certain countries will compete on that basis, or you know, people will want uh, you know, people inside the government will want it for themselves, right? And so, and I guess here's the other point: um, it may even be the case that even if everyone pays a punitive capital gains tax rate, that it will still be an overall win in terms of everyone's liberty because it means the government can't inflate anymore. It means even in that world, we would still be stuck with 21 million. So I guess these are a few different ideas around that uh, concept. Uh, and I think the other part also um, is just maybe this is like a bit more of an out there idea, but with Bitcoin, it's possible to do, to do this special technology called multi-signature, meaning you can split it up into multiple pieces and say, I need two of these three pieces or I need three of these five pieces in order to spend that Bitcoin. Now, this is a technique used by some large Bitcoin custodians even today and even individuals are able to use this technology. And this is another way in which people can put the pieces in different countries as an example. So 
these are just a few of the different ideas that are possible uh, within the Bitcoin world. Uh, although, obviously, uh, I, I think the broader point that must be accepted here is that, yes, it's likely that some governments around the world will try to become punitive. They will try to you know, tax or inc- at a high rate, they may even do this. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, there's still competition amongst the different countries. And so hopefully we'll see some jurisdictional competition there. Uh, and that may be somewhat of a, a savior of people's liberties. But I'm curious what your thoughts are. That's very interesting. I've learned a lot from that, and I thank you for it. Uh, it's interesting because uh, obviously the central banks now are buying gold again. Uh, the Western banks, of course, uh, got rid of gold. Uh, the uh, Russians and Chinese were acquiring gold, so that's been interesting. Central banks are acquiring gold. Um, there's still the interesting phenomenon from that that perspective that, of course, gold is still a suppressed price. Uh, because, uh, as we know, that there's uh, in, when each, there are about five or roughly five or six hundred pieces of paper to every piece of gold, uh, and of course it's been that people have been allowed to, allowed to trade in paper gold that they don't have, uh, and of course that's been complicit. Governments and central banks have been complicit in that because they don't want people to go to gold as money, uh, and so uh, the SEC in America has, has let that one ride. What is interesting, of course, just recently we've seen. Uh, uh, we've seen uh, J- J.P. Morgan, wasn't it, find uh, a billion odd dollars or just under a billion dollars or something uh, for actually manipulating the gold price. So first, the, the, that sort of, you know, on a trading platform basis, because the, the, the elephant in the room is, of course, is people trading under ETFs gold that they don't have. Uh, now, so yes, we know that phenomenon has happened with gold. So it makes sense that that could happen with Bitcoin. It makes absolutely that central banks uh, would acquire, if, if, if it's accepted as money, it's seen as money, uh, and it's, it's, it's that central banks would make that available to them as they have done gold. That's very interesting indeed. The, you make another very interesting point, which I've considered, as, as an old man now, I've considered carefully over the years, where do you run to? And of course, I'm now beginning, wouldn't you believe, I'm beginning to understand at, uh, at 70 odd years of age, why the pilgrims sought out the new world. I'm beginning <laughs> now to understand that. It's now no longer something you see in a history book, that they risked a, a, an Atlantic crossing, which is enormously dangerous, and to go to a place which was enormously dangerous, because they just couldn't continue the way things were. They wanted a new world. Uh, and uh, and that's now made more understandable to me. Now, where do we go physically? There isn't really anywhere to go physically now. If you look at if you look at the globe, where would you actually move yourself and your family to? It used to be down with you lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It used to be down in Australia, which is a brave new world. Uh, but you seem to have caught the politically correct idiot disease from the English. Um, and Melbourne, we look at the scenes in Melbourne. And, oh, yes. Uh, we, and we're stunned uh, because we tend to look here, both America, which is a little, now that view of land of the free and cowboys and Indians and stuff, a little bit outdated now. Um, but we've always regarded our cousins in Australia, <laughs> which is how, which is how we view Australia, as uh, as any Australian comes to London or this country, what, regardless of our sporting challenges between us uh, and, and the aggression that we have between us. I was uh, going to tell a little anecdote here. I was in a bar when I was in the army years ago. I was in a bar in Hawaii uh, and there was there was me and there was some Australian Marines and, and, and my lot and it was just getting a little bit tasty between us until the American Marines came in and the Australian Marines said to me, we'll sort this out later, mate. In the meantime, we've got this to deal with. <laughs> there you go. So we are, whether we like it, we're covered under the skin. <clears throat> and certainly, it's just, it's disappointing to see Australia pick up all the stupidities of Europe and the stupidities now of North America. And Canada's just, just the same. Canada's is just a bad. And yet I know that in the same, in England, if you go into the pubs in England, you'll find ordinary, straightforward, common sense and people who are all wondering what this government is doing. And of course, it will be, I'm quite sure, my trip to Australia was <clears throat> curtailed, obviously. We were coming out this year, 
early in 2021 to see my Australian friends uh, and get some serious drinking done. Uh, and uh, of course, we can't go. Uh, but I know I wouldn't mind betting anything you like. If I went into an Australian pub, they'd feel the same as every Englishman in an English pub. What are these people doing? Are they all mad? Yeah, it certainly feels like our countries have been taken over from within in some ways. And so I think you're right that um, it, it can it can look a little bit it can look like there's not that many options, but I think, you know, it depends on which countries around the world. There are some that have no capital gains tax as well. So that's, that's a nice little, uh, uh Isn't it interesting Steph, and we've got, uh, you've got these differentials in uh, the United States. So inheritance tax in Florida, there's no income tax in Texas. Uh, and if you move to, uh, in other States, you know, they take every penny that you've got. Um, generally the blue states, of course, uh, which are socialist. Uh, but again, like this country now, we have a conservative government, which is socialist. It's a socialist government in all but name. It's socialism in mm. all but name. Uh, and we just saw our chancellor uh, just make a speech just a couple of days ago where he referred, we'll get through all these troubles. The might of the United Kingdom state is behind you. That's a very dodgy phrase for a conservative. The might of the United Kingdom state. Oh, we saw some of that in Germany in the 1930s, the might of the state in Italy in the 1920s. I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear any of that. Thank you very much. Yeah, it's like a mask off moment, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, Stefan, yeah. So, yeah, I think um, it's uh, it's an interesting story and people often, you know, leave for better opportunities overseas. And I think maybe people will do that. And it's, and partly also, this is a digital revolution in some ways that people can actually start transacting in a way that they're not being uh, inflated, like their money's not being inflated or stopped, uh, even where they are. So in some sense, people are able to set up and do a a Bitcoin business online. uh, But I think, uh, but to the point about at what stage and phase Bitcoin is in the way we view it is more like people are going to view this more like it's a it's like a reserve asset or it's a you know it's a collateral or it's a it's it's a store of value and it's not necessarily there's not going to be large numbers of people doing day-to-day trades until other people also have savings in Bitcoin and so it's kind of we're sort of we're seeing this network effect grow over time so that's kind of how we're thinking about it Um, but an interesting point as well to the point about uh, moving overseas with your money. I mean, I'm sure you're probably familiar. There are stories of people trying to move overseas and trying to take gold overseas. And obviously, you know, it's difficult to do that or you're trying to move your even fiat dollars out, or fiat money out of the current, uh, out of the country. And then obviously the banking system can block that off. Um, but in the Bitcoin world, that can literally be as simple as creating a wallet and uh, memorizing 12 words or doing some other way to send it overseas. So I think there's a natural advantage there. Um, and also one other point I think is interesting as well, I'd love to get your thoughts on this, is um, so around this idea of, you know, rehypothecation and uh, trying to uh, keep, uh, to try to suppress the price of an asset. I think an interesting part with Bitcoin is when you run the software correctly, when you run what's called a Bitcoin full node, right? Uh, so we don't need to get too much into the technical aspects of that. That's, that's part of the journey for you as well. But when you run this software, it allows you to, to see the entire ledger uh, in, terms of the, in terms of the amount that has been issued. And so that already is, like a, is a really big win in that you can know uh, that it's, it's not, if, if you store your Bitcoins in the correct way, you can know that you haven't been, you know, your Bitcoins have not been rehypothecated. And so I think that might also be a nice comparative in that way, because Bitcoin is a technology that allows people to resist fractional reserve banking. And so I think that's an interesting idea as well. But I'm wondering, what do you think? I accept all that. Everything you say there is actually spot on. I don't, uh, I don't take issue with any of that. You're quite right, which makes it very exciting. But what I think is already happening, and I'm very new, I'm the new guy uh, here, course. but I think what is already happening and what will happen, the natural progression is to mutualize Bitcoin. So you will find that the easy way to retail Bitcoin and work Bitcoin for the punters, uh, you know, so you can sell it in the newspaper adverts, clips, and your financial advisor can deal with it, certain sort of thing, is to mutualize it. So you can say, I want to buy some Bitcoin. I, I don't want to go through all this performance because it's a bit complicated. Uh, <clears throat> but what I can do, my financial advisor can buy me uh, the Bitcoin fund. 
know, which is regulated in Britain or Luxembourg or whatever, I'll have the Bitcoin fund and I'm exposed to Bitcoin. Uh, and then, of course, it will be another system uh, where, of course, they don't buy the Bitcoin. Uh, they just monitor the price of the Bitcoin and they will pay you back, but they don't hold it in specie. And mm -hmm. then, of course, they can actually trade against it uh, by not having it and suppress it when you find you've got, you thought you had a Bitcoin, but you haven't, you have a promissory note, a mutual fund institution, or you know, somebody like BlackRock, or, or worse still, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> <laughs> you no know, goodness me, what a bunch of crooks they are. Uh, so, yeah, uh, I would see, I would see perhaps that developing for people buying Bitcoin for different reasons. Not the reason you and I might buy it buy it because we're old and canny and like gold i buy in specie but i think you could find then the price could be manipulated but, but by people who don't even as they manipulate the price of gold and have done for years and and and, and but I, you know I'm, we, we speculate we speculate who knows what's uh i mean we are now i think we, we are about to see things which I would argue are unprecedented in history. When 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 we saw the collapse of the Deutsche Mark uh, in the 1920s in the Weimar Republic, uh, which is, of course is still possibly the definitive example. You can talk about Zimbabwe, Venezuela, but who cares? You know, <laughs> who cares? That Germany, that that Germany in the 1920s was a definitive thing with a major power, with a major sophisticated Western power, and their currency crisis. But you could go to the dollar. Sterling, and at that time, many people don't know this, the franc was uh, gold backed. So the, the French franc. Uh, so there was an alternative to go to. This isn't the case now. There's no paper currency to fly to. And I mentioned in, in, in the clip here that uh, I'm talking about the Swiss franc, uh, which of course used to be backed at least by 25% gold, the Swiss franc. Uh, they're up to it's, it's back now. They've got huge equity holdings and stuff like that. It's the Swiss franc isn't what it was. Uh, it's least disastrous. It's less uh, hopeless than other fiat currencies. Uh, so interesting how that's going to develop. That we we haven't seen anything like this before. The world has never seen anything like an international collapse of banking and fiat currencies. But you know this 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 is and and indeed in America I know and I I don't want to overblow this. Um, but I have done a few videos on this. So maybe, <clears throat> maybe uh, you know, never mind about Bitcoin. My, what you might need is lots and tons of corned beef and some ammunition. <laughs> potentially. Uh, I think so. Certainly, I think you, you raised some really great points that uh, potentially there is this kind of, there is some risk that okay, Bitcoin gets co-opted and so on. I think, I guess we'd have to say it's possible. I just think it's, I would say it's probably it's towards the end of unlikely. And the reason being enough people will be holding it in their own self custody, as opposed to just leaving it somebody else to kind of custody it for them, that it just makes it more like very, very difficult for anybody to execute that. But certainly to the point around, uh, you know, uh, things degenerating quickly into, let's say a Mad Max style society or things like that, where, you know, guns, yeah. matter, having guns matters more than having Bitcoins, let's say. Um, I, we don't know the future. I, 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 it could be possible. Um, but I think for me, I, I'm actually seeing it more like Bitcoin is like a parallel system. And it's a parallel system that allows people to stop the worst of those kinds of ravages of society. And that people can have this alternative now, instead of being stuck in fiat money that's constantly going down in value, they will naturally... Uh, switch over to better alternatives right and so i think we will see this particularly where people are already feeling the pain right so people like yourself and me and probably many of my listeners who are already more thinking about money like actually thinking about what is money what makes good money what's the problem with central banking but there'll be a lot of people who don't even think about any of that they will just kind of run to whatever they can and so i think we'll see this in country in you know countries in south america some of them are already looking for ways to try to you know move money internationally and use it to um you know for example the diaspora effect where people are you know people from venezuela are going to other countries to send money home using bitcoin so that's that's kind of an example but i guess the point i'm trying to get to is i think it it may just be that 
if things get bad enough in a given country, enough people will sort of figure out why Bitcoin and how to, how to use Bitcoin such that they can still keep some semblance of trade going and hopefully, hopefully stave off the Mad Max future. Well, the uh, humankind is uh, nothing if not adaptable. Uh, so yes, I, and I, I take your point. And I have already bought some Bitcoin. Uh, so I am already, I am already satisfied that it is another way of diversifying and I shall continue to do so. So I, I won't be buying, unless of course I get a, I don't know where any more money is going to come from actually. I can't see down the road at me getting any more money now at my age and I don't care anyway. Uh, but uh, the fees I get and bits and pieces enough to start now building a diversification. My future diversification will be in Bitcoin. Another question for you, if I may, and yes. I know my gold bug followers will ask, want me to ask this. Of course, there are other Bitcoins, if I may use that dreadful expression to your uh, experts, uh, your fellow experts. You know, it, 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 is there any merit in, in, in other stuff, you know, other, other cryptocurrencies? What, what, what's your view on that? Sure. So short answer is no, uh, but let me explain. So I think it comes down to seeing Bitcoin is a network. And so ultimately it's about which of these have the strongest networks in terms of holders, in terms of people developing, in terms of exchanges that allow you to buy and sell Bitcoin, in terms of merchants that allow you to trade products and services for Bitcoin and in terms of the kind of financialization. And so I think there's this kind of tendency for people to think, oh, you know, what if Bitcoin is the MySpace and there's a Facebook coming and so on. But I think the important point is to really understand that Bitcoin is actually the successor in something like three or four decades worth of p people working at this idea of trying to create digital money. And so I think uh, the key point for me in terms of uh, altcoins, the other currencies, is that, well, there's a few things here. So some of them are not even trying to be money, first off. Some of them are just not, are simply not as decentralized as they claim to be. And so fundamentally, there's somebody somewhere who could be pressured to pull a lever to change the supplier, to change some characteristic of the system. Whereas with Bitcoin, because it was designed by an anonymous founder, Satoshi Nakamoto, or a group, we don't know, uh, that it's, it would just be too difficult to sort of recreate that again. And so now it's sort of, it's like an open source money. It's just out there and nobody really control. There's no kind of one group who control it. And so that is part of its uh, strength in a way that there's nobody there to kind of stop. There's no central company or mo companies who are running most of the infrastructure for Bitcoin. And so I think, those are probably some of the key points. Uh, it takes a little bit of research and reading to come to that. But I think the other key point as well is, I mean, if we look at someone like Mises, right, he, he speaks about this idea of uh, if, even if you have this world of competing monies, they would be one by one rejected until you're left with the most saleable one. And I think he mentions that in Theory of Money and Credit, right? And so I think we have to be very like cognizant of that point that it's, it's going to be very much like a winner takes all sort of market. And so... I think that is why for me personally, I'm in the Bitcoin, I'm in the Bitcoin only camp, uh, but I can understand when people are coming into the space and they're trying to understand, oh, what about, what about these other coins? Do, should I have those? Uh, and I think fundamentally, that's why I try to, because here's the problem, right? Whenever, whoever can print money will. And what happened in the space is, is exactly. yeah, right. And so what's happened in the space is that essentially people would invent these very paper thin rationalizations for creating a new coin because they wanted to be the king of the new coin, right? And they wanted to be the one printing the money. And so that's been a very strong tendency. And in fact, many past Bitcoin people have then turned around and started their own altcoin to try and, you know, and so for me as somebody trying to teach people in the space, I have to be very careful to try and educate them about why they have to take a very skeptical eye to altcoins basically. So I guess, Hopefully that helps. Do you have any more questions? I'm happy to answer if you do. No, that uh, you've answered that very well. I, 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 I've done enough. I'm revising because uh, two years ago I, I looked quite carefully uh, and then uh, now I'm sort of revising rather than coming new. And that's pretty the conclusion I'd come to myself. A little bit the same way, not, not quite the same way. Is the reason I went for gold and not other precious metals like platinum and, and other stuff. Because if you're going to diversify anyway, uh, I think we need to 
diversify mainstream in what in what you're going to call Bitcoin main, mainstream in that asset class. I used to run, used to you know write do stuff like that on asset classes, because it's interesting. Just on another subject here, when mm. it comes to equities, pe people always say uh, your your equity gurus will always say, ah yes, you know equities, but you've got to get the right equity to get this equities and you've got to buy this and you've got to buy that of course what they always overlook uh, or, or conveniently overlook is that when the stock market crashes as this one is going to do make no mistake there are going to be shares there that haven't crashed <laughs> they all crash uh, some crash more than others but when you see a stock market crash i mean for example i do hold the only equities i think i hold now left are uh, gold mining stocks. Well, I would, wouldn't I? Uh, because sometimes holding gold in specie in certain trust funds is just too complicated technically. So I hold gold funds uh, and they've done reasonably well. Uh, but when we have a stock market cra uh, crash, they will crash. They will bounce quicker than anything else, but they will crash too because you need to cover your position. Uh, so thinking that you can be, you can outsmart the market by buying, you know, very clever equity selection, you can't. Nobody ever has. Uh, some guys are cleverer than others, uh, and uh, and I remember once in the 80s when I was representing a big equity house uh, in London giving a, a lecture there saying that uh, the great thing about my bank is that we will lose you less money than anybody else. <laughs> well, that's unfortunately become the game now because people don't believe, they don't sense that there's anywhere to keep their cash balance. And that is why we've seen uh, companies now look at Bitcoin as a cash balance uh, asset as well. Exactly. I mean, that's a very, very important point. Uh, and I was holding cash, uh, when I was holding cash, uh, even, uh, I'm going back uh, maybe uh, to 15 years, and I was holding cash uh, with major institutions, uh, you know, ticking the cash box. No, I want out of the market here, only to find out that regulation was so slack, it wasn't cash at all. It wasn't cash. It was all sorts of weird options here and options there. And so cash, my cash funds fell uh, by 6%. Um, and I, I drilled, I didn't get caught in 2007. By then, you know, I was very wise. I dug right down. What is it that they hold? Uh, is it a doctor's house in Arlington or is it trailer trash in, in South Chicago? I never made that mistake again. And it was a small mistake, but it was a well-learned well -learned mistake. Uh, but of course, you've got lots of fund managers who run council, uh, uh, civil servants who run their council, run their funds and bits and pieces. Uh, but these people aren't experts. You know, they, they don't know uh, if Standard and Poor give us a three star rating. They think it's a three star rating. I can't believe that Moody's and Standard and Poor and these people are still around after 2007. These children that rate bonds, uh, they should have all been hanged from a lamppost. And they're still there running their big bucks. Some of them haven't even started shaving. Yeah, I, and that's the problem that we're faced with, right? I mean, negative rates, bonds at ridiculously low yields. Uh, what is a company treasurer to do? And what are individuals to do? And what are fund managers to do? I think, you figure, I think you might put your finger on something which is much more important. The reason for this uh, this discussion is uh, for me to learn and my followers to learn as well. Hopefully, um, that that that's triggered in my head. That's that's triggered in my head. Is this a corporate cash alternative? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. It it actually is, or certainly could be, in a much bigger way than I might previously imagine. Very interesting. That yeah, yeah. And uh, I think look, the other thing is some. Well, think of it this way: some people are forced into holding government bonds because of regulation or because there might be some kind of treatment in terms of the banking system that it kind of works a little bit better for them. But if you have the choice, uh, you know, uh, and, and if you don't want to play the greater fool game, the greater fool theory of I buy this bond and I'm going to, I'm going to offload it to somebody else for a greater price. Yeah. And you're thinking, yeah. you're really thinking for the longer term then what else, how else, what else would you, how, you know, what else would make sense than an asset that you can self custody and you know, this, the eventual supply of it, and you know, what fraction of the total supply that you have. So I think that's really a very powerful message. And we are starting to see more, um, and I guess even 
you know, you've recently left the EU, but uh, there's been a lot of chatter about in the EU about negative rates coming as well. Well, it's interesting, the ECB, and uh, it's on my website. Uh, I cross-examined uh, Draghi, who was the president then. I'm going back to 2014, an interesting exchange. It got quite a few hits. I don't know whether you've seen it. And he said, well, I said, you know, you're talking about rescuing the Spanish economy and you're doing this, that and the other. And I said, you've, you've rescued it for about six weeks from what I can see looking at these numbers. And uh, he looked at me and he said, well, Mr. Bloom, you just have to trust me. <laughs> and I said, you're a central banker. I said, I wouldn't trust you as far as I can throw you. And there was a guy, you can't, in the European Union, you can't talk like that to these big people, you know. Um, but uh, it's interesting to see the ECB, uh, if you drill down, they say that, let's say, I mean, they're buying, they're the people who are buying sovereign debt. They're buying Italian sovereign debt, for example. You know, really? Yeah, gosh. Uh, and the other thing they're doing, they're buying corporate bonds. So they're buying things like uh, Volkswagen Finance or something like that, or BMW, and they're claiming that that's asset back. They say, oh, yes, we're buying this stuff, but this, they're asset back bonds, which fits in with the uh, the story of, you know, what we're doing, the ECB are doing, and, you know, we'll do whatever it takes, if I may quote uh, Monsieur Drunk, who incidentally is a very nice guy. He's a, he's a nice guy. He's a typical charming Italian, doesn't understand money at all, uh, but a very charming guy. Uh, and, of course, asset backed. Uh, I think I put this in my book. In uh, I've done a little book, Magic of B Banking. It's more of an aid memoir. Uh, it's more of an aid memoir than a book, so that an intelligent layman can spend 40 minutes and think, I'm beginning to understand how they're conning me. Mm. Uh, but of course, oh, it's asset back. Well, what have you actually bought if it's BMW or Volkswagen Finance? Is you've bought next door's teenage son's secondhand BMW, which is worthless. Uh, and the ECB are claiming that it's asset backed. But the trouble is, of course, if, if I, I get to get on to it, to mainstream media now. Mainstream media don't understand money or banking either. Uh, I've lectured at banking conferences where the bankers don't understand banking and money. There are people in the BBC, the Times newspaper, the Financial Times as well, who are their economic correspondents who I've had lunch with. I know these people. They have no understanding of bank your money at all. They're absolutely clueless. And, of course, in a, the people who are protecting society, protecting ordinary punter, is it should be your, uh, your correspondent, your economics correspondent of public service broadcasting, the BBC, should be cross-examining the Chancellor, who actually every year presents his budget illegally. He doesn't put in his budget uh, any uh, liabilities for public sector pensions or public funding initiatives. If you did that for, uh, uh, as a company, as Shell or BP, if you did that, you'd go to prison. It's illegal. And every day, every year, he stands up the chance of the Exchequer telling you that our debt, our debt ratios are only 89% of GDP. They're 200% of GDP. The man's a liar and a cheat. And if he's watching this, Ricky Tiki Tarby, who's a, another really nice guy, actually, I've met him. He's a nice guy, pleasant guy. Um, two things. He either doesn't understand banking and money, which I suspect is the case, or he is another ex Goldman Sachs crook. <laughs> I don't know. You tell me. Uh, Godfrey, on this topic of uh, EU uh, bureaucrats, uh, I'm curious as well. There's been some discussion coming out of you know, EU around central bank digital currencies and uh, uh, this kind of story of, oh, we're going to compete and we're going to put this central bank digital currency out. I'm wondering, uh, do you have any views on the central bank digital currency and whether they uh, will be, what's your view on their prospects for success on that? Uh, well, <clears throat> the goal, this is something that is not generally understood, uh, certainly in my own country. We all talk about trade here. We're always talking about trade and our trade arrangements. Trade's got nothing whatsoever to do with the European Union. Nothing whatsoever to do with it. It's an ideal. It's a great political ideal. It's a dream that is held fervently with religious fervour. I worked out there for 10 years. We're not talking about trade here. We're talking about one entity with its own anthem, its own leader, its own system. So certainly the goal, uh, the, the goal will be a digital currency which the ECB could control. They will have things like 
national wages, minimum wages for everybody. Uh, and they will bring, the, this is the goal for them to bring all this in so they have complete and total control of everything. Uh, because it's it's a control system. The European Union is a control system. There is no democratic ethos in it. The rules and regulations, of course, are made by the uh, by the uh, European Commission. The Parliament is an amending chamber, where it's that amending chamber. It's got nothing to do with making the law at all. It, it, it's, it, they call it a Parliament, but it's not a Parliament at all. It's a talking shop. The deal's already been done by the Commission. Unelected bureaucrats, most of whom are French. Uh, so consequently, uh, the answer is yes, that is where they're heading. That is the goal. That is their dream. The only other flip side of that argument, of course, is the European Union is one of the most incompetent and corrupt organisations since the Byzantine Empire. These people are appallingly stupid and incompetent. So that may be the goal of a national, uh, an inter, a, a, Euro, a, a pan-European digital currency. The question is when it gets there. I mean. I mean, I don't know how they find their way to the lavatory, some of these people. I really don't. So whether it's actually going to happen, I don't think it will happen in my lifetime. But then, of course, I'm an old geezer, so that might not be very long. <laughs> uh, it seemed very hearty. So I think you've got, you got a good amount of time. Uh, I am also uh, wanted to bring up, so your book, The Magic of Banking, I had a read of it. And uh, I, I, there was really an interesting point that you were making, is, which is that there seems to be this perception that major countries cannot go bankrupt right why why do people believe this why why are they so quick to forget uh the lessons of history this is a very deeply and widely held view because and the response you'll get uh, is well the government prints money so how can they go bankrupt if they can just print money <clears throat> of course what they don't understand is yes of course they can go on printing money but if it's completely worthless uh, they're bankrupt uh, in all but name. And, and, and so consequently, that is the projection. Um, and people don't understand it because if you talk, for example, to a retired school teacher in England who's on an index linked pension to die for that you couldn't possibly get in any other or any civil servant, um, they retire maybe at 55 or 56. They retire early, which in, in the commercial world is almost impossible. And the cost of a pension these days with life expectancy is almost impossible to do that. <clears throat> they get an increase every year of 2% or whatever the CPI rate is. They, are de they deeply believe that that will continue forever because there's some kind of magic money tree that it comes from. They have no concept of where the money comes from. They know that it's a government pension and therefore it must be uh, it must be sacrosanct. The idea that one day that check won't come, uh, which is the sort of situation you see in second or third world countries or even parts of Europe, like Greece, for example, <clears throat> the pension just doesn't arrive, it doesn't arrive until they uh, until the Greeks manage to screw the Germans out of another loan. Uh, you know, and the Germans don't understand. The German punter doesn't understand it. Your Audi worker, your BMW worker, uh, going to work, with, he doesn't understand uh, any of these matters. Uh, bless his cotton socks. He's working hard. He's producing good vehicles and they're being bought. But of course, with the shadow banking system and Deutsche Bank is a classic example of that, with something like 900 billion uh, euros of shadow banking debt. They've sent all these cars to these countries, exported all these cars, and of course they've been paid under a shadow banking system. As far as Germany is concerned, they might as well have dumped all those cars in the North Sea. They're never really going to be paid for them. <laughs> it's all magic, hence the title of my book, Magic of Banking. It's all magic, um, and it's part of the magic that they have persuaded people <clears throat> that a country can't go broke, like the local factory. Um, <clears throat> And this is another huge awakening uh, that is coming, and it's coming much sooner than people imagine. Uh, these checks will just stop coming, or they'll have to cap checks. We have people in the in the sector, in our public sector, who are on unbelievable salaries. You know, the, at the town, the, we used to call them the chief clerk, and then we had all this new sort of stuff coming in. They now call the chief executive, of the, and they're at the town hall, and they're on two hundred thousand pounds a year. Most of them have failed solicitors. 
um, and that Lord only was what they make under the counter, because this country is a very sophisticated Nigeria. Uh, the corruption here is absolutely deep, but we're far too clever to let the punters know how it works. So uh, their pensions were enormous. So they're retiring early on pensions of in the region of £150,000 a year index link. My village alone, my village, I live in a tiny, tiny village. There's only 120 souls all told in my little village in Yorkshire. We have six, no, we have eight retired civil servants. Charming people, very nice people, got nothing against them. But I worked out what the value of their pension was. If you had to buy it from an insurance company today, they all retired under 60, it's all index linked. And they were all quite senior-ish people. Uh, so they would have been on salaries of 50 or 60,000. The cost of those pensions on the open market would be nine million, nine million pounds. And that's in my tiny little Yorkshire village alone. Nationwide, we're talking billions and trillions of pounds for these characters all on their indexing pension who then go back to the civil service or the school to earn pin money <laughs> to top up. You know, it's, the whole system's crazy. And when history looks at this, when economic historians look at this, <clears throat> they will scratch their heads and wonder, what were, they, what were they thinking? Did they think they could do this forever? Did they think they could do this forever? And they won't believe it. And Her Majesty, uh, when the 2007, you might have got the quote down there in, uh, in Australia. I'm sure you did. Uh, when she, she was at a, a, a dinner or something, it was 2008, I think it was, to economists and bankers. You know, it was, a, it was a senior dinner in her speech after dinner. She said, how is it you didn't see any of this coming? And that's Her Majesty. And of course, I wrote a letter to the palace because I held the Queen's Commission. I said, Your Majesty, I did. I did. <laughs> I'll come for tea and I'll explain it to you. That's the um, that's the great irony, isn't it? I mean, it seems like, you know, looking back, people will see how did they how did they let it get this bad? Why did they do this incredibly unsustainable uh, government spending and projects? And the reality is that it just wasn't convenient to listen to the people who were saying it was unsustainable, right? Just extraordinary. Our Prime Minister yesterday morning has said we're going to go to 100% wind power. He wants to visit South Australia. It's a, yeah, it's a joke, right? They'll I mean, tell him all about wind power. Germany's did up. They're building emergency power stations because Germany tried to go that route. The Iberian Peninsula. But you can't tell Boris. In fact, I've come to the conclusion you can't tell anybody who graduated from Oxford University anything. I think they have a secret lobotomy as soon as they get there. That's my theory. <laughs> uh, and I, I just, I mean, to me, it just seems like such a great injustice also, because essentially younger taxpayers, younger generations are the ones who will foot the bill for all of this craziness. And so it, it becomes almost like a generational conflict because it's kind of like older generations might uh, spend and spend away. And then that, you know, the younger generations are being left to pick up the tab for that. And so that seems like a very uh, strong injustice there to me. And uh, I think that is also a big part of why people, at least in my experience, are now open, more open to the idea of alternatives like Bitcoin. You're, ap you're absolutely right. Uh, I mean, it's disgraceful. My generation uh, has let down uh, the country uh, with baby boomers. I'm a baby boomer. I've had 70 years of basically peace in Europe and a prosperous, a broadly prosperous economy. <clears throat> and we're leaving, we're leaving youngsters. When I die, the next generation will have the biggest debt in our history. But of course, as an Austrian school economist, you will also understand that is all about welfareism. But if you go to an English university, they're all in favor of it. Uh, the average university student group is neo-socialist, almost to a man. And the ones that aren't in the lecture hall, of course, are playing rugby. They're not. <laughs> They're proper <laughs> chaps. They're at parties, going out with girls. They're not in the debating hall. That's for geeks, isn't it? But I mean, <laughs> it's absolutely uh, it's absolutely disgraceful that we could have handed over a country uh, uh, after 70 years of prosperity and a mess. It's not just us. <clears throat> it's France. It's Spain. It's Italy. It's the United States. We've all done it. We all talk about money, we talk about gold standards, but the cancer in the soul of a nation is welfareism. The concept that you can get money for not working, which is what welfareism is, 
and was not the original idea under Beveridge in 1942, 1943, when the Beveridge report put out the template. For, uh, it was to put a safety net under people who were suffering unfortunate circumstances with no fault of their own. It is now a lifestyle choice. And that is at the root of the problem for the Western democracies, the liabilities they have under welfareism, which they don't have in the Far East. Uh, I worked in Hong Kong for a while. The concept of paying somebody when I was in Hong Kong for not working was belong beyond the Cantonese mind. They, they, the Chinese simply couldn't understand why you would pay for somebody for not working. Um, it, 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 they look after their own old, of course. You know, the Chinese have a respect for their elders. And if, if grandma's poorly, she stays at home and they look after her. They couldn't understand this concept of state welfare. And that is, you can't talk about so many things, gold standards, money, Bitcoin, without addressing, and it's the elephant in the room that we're not allowed to talk about. We're not allowed to talk about welfareism. It punishes savers, and in some sense, it it also makes people as entrepreneurs perhaps less likely to even try to be innovative. And so it it sort of stifles the soul of uh, the people in that country. And uh, perhaps it's I think it's fair to argue that uh, it 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 kind of acts as a drag on that country's long term uh, economic growth and prosperity. Yes, it does, and you've got to be. <clears throat> It should be made really easy to start a business uh, and perpetuate a business. Uh, and that's, of course, this desire of regulation. We're swamped, and we were in the European Union. I sat through, I was there for 10 years, and I saw 2,000 new regulations passed a year, 2,000 new regulations a year, quite at an extraordinary speed. You vote electronically out there. It was quite the most extraordinary phenomenon at the speed at which these regulations came. And of course, uh, they have a system of corpus juris, the Napoleonic Code in their legal system, which we don't have. We have common law. Uh, and so we saw more We saw more law passed uh, in our period of membership of the European Union than we had in its entirety since the 1688 Bill of Rights, right the way through to us joining the European Union. You can't do anything to regulate for everything and that stifles entrepreneurship um the and now and small businesses are entrepreneurial everything starts as a small business when the government here i'm sure it's the same in australia uh the government will tell you what you can pay what the holidays are uh maternity leave paternity leave bereavement leave you can't sack anybody if they're useless you've got to go through an unbelievable procedure it's worse in france instead um and Belgium, uh, <clears throat> but they're not the sort of benchmarks we want. You, to build an entrepreneurial society, a rich society, you want low tax and low regulation, and under the principles of law, and English law. A contract between, if you wanted to employ me, I wanted to employ you, under common law, you should sign a contract that we're both happy with, you get it, I'll get mine. I don't want a politician sitting at the table. I don't want a politician saying, uh, cutting across of, of contract law, telling me that, no, I can't pay you that, or I can't do this, I'll give you that amount, or I've got to do this for your pension scheme. That's just, as an employer, you make your own. And then people say, oh, uh, you know, when it comes to uh, uh, pensions, oh, the, you know, old people, be, I've got my own pension, I don't need anything from the state. I don't need a state pension scheme. And I've paid, I've worked it out once on a calculator on a bold wet afternoon. I've paid two million pounds in tax since I left school in 1967. If you give me that back, I don't want any pensions and I don't want any national health. I don't want anything from you, the state. I don't want anything from the state. Just get off my back. Uh, and I've done a few lectures to universities on this, uh, on the basis of how you could, Bitcoin, it's right up the Bitcoin street, is let's all have a little card <clears throat> which absolves us from any responsibility to the state or the state to us. So you fill up your car, you can fill your car for £20, not £50. Your pint of beer doesn't cost you three pounds, it costs you one pound. Your salary is all yours. Where are you getting it? At the end of the month, no deductions. But the deal is you don't want anything from the state. You keep all your own money. So you can have your own private health insurance. You can have your own pension scheme. You don't want anything from the state. Yeah. System. Who wouldn't buy for, go for that? Unless, of course, unless you're sucking at the teat 
of the state. If you're one of the millions of people who for the state, and you're not very comfortable with that idea. And I, I said another thing that might amuse uh, uh, people watching. I was lecturing at York University when I was in office. So there I was, a little old bald politician. And I said to the, the, to the kids in, in the classes, <clears throat> do you think you can make decisions for yourself better than the state can make? Do you think I could make decisions for you and your families better than you can make them from yourself? Hands up. You would be horrified at the number of hands that went up that thought I could make better decisions than they could for themselves. We have a whole generation now of young people who believe that the state is their savior. The state is their support, not the people most li likely to rob you. It, it all ties in with this idea of Bitcoin. And uh, this is a, well, a very popular book within Bitcoin circles. And I'm sure you've heard of it as well, The Sovereign Individual. And uh, that one really spells out some of this thesis that uh, it's almost like a digital uh, way of exiting in some in some sense, right? Not a hundred percent, but it's part of that. It's it's part of the answer. And so we, we might also. It's an interesting point there as well that you make about the people who are producers and the people who are, let's say, sucking at the teat. That uh, what the situation we're getting into now is that governments are basically making it so that there's less people producing. Uh, as a ratio versus the number of people sucking at the teat. And so what happens when those productive people want to opt out, when they want to leave, and there's, they're leaving even less productive people behind to kind of foot the bill for all the people sucking at the teat? You make a very interesting point, which I've made uh, many times myself. We, there are either wealth creators or wealth consumers. There's only two types of people, those that create wealth and those don't. Now, here's a horrifying thing. Uh, there's a guy at the Adam Smith Institute uh, who I was a co-speaking, uh, I was a co-speaker at Durham University, who didn't understand what a wealth creator was. He didn't understand it. This is a man from the Adam Smith Institute. Um, I was trying to explain to the students that walk away from this idea that you have to be a captain of an industry to be a wealth creator. Your local hairdresser is a wealth creator. Your little guy. Uh, the greengrocers is a wealth creator because he's a guy that's putting into the state with his taxes. Now, your chief executive at the town hall earning £200,000 a year is a wealth consumer. You might have what you consider worthy wealth consumers, like a top surgeon earning £250,000 a year for the national health. He's a consumer of wealth, not a creator of wealth, no matter how noble or nice he may be. We've got two, and we are now at the situation, we're getting very close, and you're quite right to point it out, Stefan. You're right on the ball here. <clears throat> we're getting to the stage where there are so many people consuming wealth and too few actually creating it. Not just those that are working, it's politicised charities, it's quangos. The number of people who work in some way directly for the state, and then, of course, you've got to look at people who work indirectly for the state. You know, on state contracts, on permanent state contracts. So, for example, the guy coming to cut, I have a small holding in, in Yorkshire. The guy coming to cut our hedges, he wanted, uh, for 200 yards worth of hedge or something, he wanted £2,000. Uh, and it was just outrageous and totally ridiculous. Uh, and everything he does is for the local council. So he charges something like £100 a yard or whatever it is to clip hedges. I can't remember what it, what it is. Unchallenged. So he does all the work for the local council. It's unchallenged because they don't have to negotiate a deal. They just pay him because it's not their money. I got a guy to do it for £600. He did a very good job. So it isn't even what we see. It isn't even the guy at the town hall who we know is a lemon. Uh, it's all the guys that work directly for the town hall and only for the town hall, charging phenomenal amounts of money. Uh, they're also sucking at the teat. And... Nobody in government has a serious background in commerce on both sides, Labour Party or Conservative Party, on the front benches. There's nobody there who actually so much as ran a whelk stall. These people have no idea of commerce whatsoever. And poultry, the civil service, bear in mind somebody, the people who negotiate our trade agreements uh, are civil servants who at university, usually Oxford, decided at Oxford <clears throat> they were not going to go into commerce. They made that decision as very young men not to go into commerce. 
They're now negotiating international trade agreements. You couldn't think of anybody less suited to go and negotiate with the European Union, which is why we've made a mess of it for 40 years. And we're still making a mess of it. I mean, you don't need trade agreements. You and I don't need a trade. Don't I want to buy something for you down there in Australia? You send me the bill, I send you the money. It's certainly not any politicians, do we? What's that got to do with anything? And of course, as soon as you get a trade agreement, it comes with baggage. We're talking over here at the moment about a trade agreement with the United States. All that means is we have a tariff-free game for some goods, so big business will win out of it. But the, the other thing is, of course, we will have to accept whatever the CIA give us. If the CIA, CIA tell us we're going to do this, this and this, that's what we'll do, because that will be part of the unseen package of a trade agreement. I don't like trade agreements. I wouldn't have trade agreements with anybody. I would just have no tariffs. Let's have an international free tariff. <clears throat> I can't see that one flying because too many people have got their hand in the till. It's unfortunate. And uh, yeah, so uh, I think uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, just, it's all just going to drive people to look for alternatives. And I think that for me is uh, really where this is at. Um, You're absolutely right. So look, I've, I've really enjoyed chatting with you, Godfrey. It's probably a good time to uh, finish off here. But if you had any closing thoughts for the listeners, and of course, let the listeners know where they can find you online. Well, I look forward to uh, continuing everybody who's come. It's been an enormous response I've had <clears throat> on Twitter and stuff. I have, a, I have a website, obviously, which is so easily found. That's got to be Because I've been writing articles on that in various, not just money and economics, other things, defence and so on and so forth, for some time. And uh, if, if I can just be a little bit arrogant on this, if you read it on my website, it will be common knowledge in about two years' time. Everything I've written has come true. <clears throat> and I'm always right. And this is the reason my wife said you've got no friends. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, I'll leave some of the links in the show notes for listeners who want to find you online. Let's keep the thing rolling. It's fascinating. Well, thank you for joining me, Godfrey. Thank you so much for inviting me. Subscribe to the show at stefanlevera.com and I'll see you in the Citadels.